So my name is Simon Brown. Uh, in the second of the series, Know Your Derivatives, today we're looking at margin, leverage, and exposure. And, and if you are an old hand at trading, you're like, but this stuff's simple. Well, of course, yes, because you're an old hand. But if you're new to trading, these are three very, very important components that we need to wrap our head around. We need to understand how they work, how they work for or against us, how they relate to, to, to you know, what we're paying, the fees and, and the like and that. So hugely important that we get a grasp onto them and to handle them, particularly the exposure. And, and as you migrate through trading levels and you become more proficient at your trading, certainly your exposure issue, and I'm going to touch on it, becomes less, less critical, but it's still, it's still important. It's always going to be important. I'm always going to kick off a derivative trading presentation by reminding people that you can lose more money than you start with. Today, I will give you very hard examples on that, but you absolutely can. You can lose more than you start with. That is a real risk in the trading space. So what is margin exposure and leverage? Margin is your good faith deposit. It's essentially, it's held as surety, for want of a better phrase, um, it, and it will vary between the different platforms, and it might even change over time, and we'll talk around what might drive that change. But in essence, you're taking a position in a asset, be that a currency, an index, a commodity, an equity, heck, even a crypto. You're taking a position in it, and there's a risk that you will lose money. Basically, the platform provider is saying, look, you know, if you're going to maybe lose some money, can we put some cash aside? Can we park some cash? Uh, so, you know, you've got your free cash in your portfolio. They essentially will take some ring fence it and say, that's the margin. That's the security. In case you lose any money, we know that we can be paid for that particular loss. Because these platforms are not in the business of, of, of you know, taking on client losses. They're not trading against you either. They're there to facilitate the process, but they need to protect themselves. They're going to make money from the fees, the transaction costs, and the like. Exposure is the asset value. It's what your actual exposure is. Your margin is a deposit. It's, it's like if you're buying a new car and you pay a deposit on the car, and that deposit might be, I don't know, let's make it a fancy car. You pay a 50,000 Rand deposit. That's not the value of the car. It's not the price of the car. The price of the car would be the exposure, say half a million. You've put down a 10% deposit, but that's the value of the car is half a million. Now, of course, when you're buying a car, you're going to have to pay off the balance. It is different in this scenario. And then that leverage or that gearing, and we spoke about that a bit in the first in this series, really is that acceleration of the move. In other words, the underlying asset moves 5%, uh, but you make a 50% profit. And they're all important. We're going to delve into all three of them uh, in, in more detail. Let's start off with that leverage exposure. This is particular to, to CFDs uh, and to CFD-like products. And the point being is that you've got a 20,000 Rand portfolio, but you might get exposure to 200,000 Rand. In other words, you could go and buy shares worth 200,000 Rand. You could make a profit or a loss on that 200,000 Rand, but your deposit, your margin is only that 20,000. Now, there are a couple of points I need to make here. Firstly, Let's take a totally crazy scenario. You went and you went all in. You've got 200,000 Rand exposure. You've put your 20,000 Rand good faith deposit, your margin down, and uh, the next day, whatever that asset is, it goes to zero. Uh, let's forget the mechanics of how it goes to zero. Let's pretend it does. It goes to zero in a blink of an eye. Your risk, your exposure was 200,000. You now owe 200,000. That's what your loss is, 200,000 SAR. Problem is you only put down 20. And that's what I mean when I say that you can lose more than you start with. You had 20,000, thing went to zero, and now you've lost. But there's another way this potentially works, is let's say you went short. Remember we spoke about shorting in the first video. Shorting is where you're looking to make money on the downside. So you've sold 200,000 rands worth of shares, and you've put down your 20,000 rand margin. And then someone comes and makes a buyout offer for that company at 100% premium. In other words, they're offering 400,000 for your 200,000 of, 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 of shares or whatever it might be, cryptos, commodities, FX, that it might be. It would be shares in the example of a buyout. That now means that the value has now gone to 400,000. You were betting on it going down, and it went up. Your exposure has gone from 200 to 400,000. You're now 200,000 
you've lost it. And the point is you need to pay it. I mean, it's not like, oh, well, that's sad and you walk away. No, no, no. <laughs> Your counterparty who's going to be the platform you're trading with, they're going to want their 200,000. They've got the first 20, but they're going to want the other 180. So that exposure is your risk, your full risk. Now, truthfully, shares very seldom, commodities very seldom, FX very seldom, cryptos, all of them, they very seldom suddenly go to zero or suddenly double in price. The going to zero would be a bankruptcy scenario. A sudden double in price would be a takeover scenario. Do they happen? You betcha. Do they happen frequently? No, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't call it a, a frequent experience. But that is your exposure. That is your risk. And that's how we work the margin. So we work the margin, so the leverage, by saying our 200,000 is our exposure, our 20,000 is our margin. We divide the 20 into the 200, and we get 10 times. So now you've got 10 times gearing, which means every 1% move in that underlying will give you a 10% profit or loss. And that is your leverage effect. That is gearing. The words can be used interchangeably. Once it's happened, once you're in, if it goes your way, it's going to be absolutely great. When it doesn't go your way, it's a horror. And you can see the, the very simple line art I've put in the side down here. You know, the share goes nicely up, but the CFD goes up a whole lot more. Ditto, the share goes down a bit, but the CFD goes down a whole lot more. Now, whether you're long or short, in the top scenario, if you're long, you made money, but if you were short, you lost. In the lowest scenario, if you were short, you made money, but if you were long, you lost. Philip, would the broker platform not stop out once the margin has eroded? Yes, it will, and I'm gonna to come to that. You're 100% right on that point. So this is what we call that acceleration, the amplification of the move. Your derivative moves faster than the underlying asset. And that's, that's why we're trading derivatives, right? Because if you were just trading straight equity, you know, if we look at the, 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 the market today, what, multi-choice was up 7%. It's not bad. No, it's actually quite a chunky move. But average, in an average day, shares are moving a couple of percentage points up or down. There's money to be made, but it's slow money. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with slow money, but you want to juice that return, so to speak. And that's where the derivative comes in. So in the case of multi-choice, you didn't make 7%, you made 70%. Of course, in the case of multi-choice, if you had been betting it would go down and it went up 7, you haven't made, you have lost 70%. And that's critically important. So it's great when it goes your way. It's a horror when it doesn't. And there's ways we manage this. There's a number of different ways we manage this. And I'm going to come to some of them later in this presentation. And then we'll talk some of them in the next one where we look at, at uh, managing risk more broadly. And I want that to change. So an example, I've used a share in the CFD here, uh, same slide we used last time because it's a, the relevant one. The price is 100 Rand. So you buy the share, you'd pay 100 Rand. You buy the CFD, you would pay 100 Rand. That would be the entry point to it. And you want exposure to 250. The person who's buying shares pays 100 Rand times the 250. They pay 25,000 Rand. That is their position. That is their cost. Their exposure is 25,000 Rand, and their leverage is one. For every 1% move in that share price, they will make or lose 1%. The CFD trader has got the same entry, 100 bucks, same quantity, 250, same exposure, 25,000, but they only put down 5,000 Rand margin. So the 5,000 divided into the 25 exposure gives you your leverage of five times. So if the share moves 1%, the share trader makes 1%, the CFD trader makes 5%. If it moves 10% and we go up 10 Rand, so that share has now gone from 100 to 110, the person on the shares has made themselves to 10%, the person on the CFD has made themselves 50%. Understand where I get that 50% from. Your profit or loss is determined on the actual exposure that 25,000 Rand. The share moved 10%, so you made that profit there. And your profit was 2,500. That's where it comes from. Exposure 25, move 10, you've made a 2,500 Rand profit. But with the person buying the share put in 25,000, you only put down a 5,000 Rand margin, good faith deposit. You put down 5,000, you've made 2,500, 
So you've essentially given yourself a 50% return because of that five times leverage. Now we can, you know, truthfully, you can also say, well, my profit was two and a half thousand, my exposure was 25. I hear you on that. But when we look at the, the bigger picture, which you will in a slide or two, and as you structure a, a trading portfolio and you look at the complete concept of a trading portfolio, what matters is truthfully your exposure, but what also matters is actually the cash in the, in the account. Uh, Ivor, yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to come to that. If markets fall incredibly fast as they did 08 or back in March, uh, they will try and get you out. But if the broker can't get you out, then they can't get you out and the pain is yours. So how is that margin decided? Where does it come from? In essence, the, the provider will decide in the margin. You know, your, your platform provider. Um, they will look at issues such as volatility, asset classes being traded. So you'll often see currency less volatile, your margin requirement is quite small and hence, you know, you might only have to put down one or 2%, which means ultimately you're getting a gearing of around 50 or 100. Uh, sometimes they'll look at specific counters and they'll say, we think that share is more risky than that one. Or maybe that commodity is more risky than that one. Some, so some providers will be granular at the level of the individual shares. Some just sort of look at the asset class that has been traded. Think markets, for example, local equity CFDs, they want 10% margin which means you've got 10 times leverage. Your gearing is 10, regardless of which particular share it is. Some will say, no, no, on that share we want 30%, on that share we want 10%, and they will do it as per the individuals. Because there's also issues around liquidity, because liquidity adds risk in the sense of low liquidity. So liquidity is how much value is going through the market. And that means how easily can I get in and out? Particularly, as what Ivo was saying, when markets are crashing, if there's low liquidity, getting out is really, really hard. And when I say really hard, I mean sometimes nigh on impossible in a sense. And, and there's an easy solution for that as a trader is stay away from the low liquid. You know, folks go and trade second tier stocks, mid cap stocks, and then they gear it. Man, your second tier mid cap stock is already essentially geared. Uh, Soho Sun last week was up about 300% in one week, one stock. You don't need to gear that. 300% is an insane return for a week. Sure, I know what you're thinking. Man, if I geared that, I would have made 3,000%. Yeah, but if it went the wrong way, you know, those sort of stocks are so volatile already, in part because they're small, in part because they're low liquid. So broadly, yeah, I say if you're going to trade the second tier stocks, you don't need the gearing. The gearing is for those top tier stocks. You know, sort of top 40, maybe top 50. My, my rule of thumb is I want a stock to, I, in, in, a, in a perfect world, I want a stock to be doing pretty much at least about 20 million a day at a bare minimum for me to be interested in, in putting some, some, some gearing on it. And then even truthfully, I'd like to push that number higher, you know, even to 250 million. And that cuts out a lot of shares, but they, you get those shares, they're moving anyway. You don't necessarily need it. I mentioned a moment ago why we look at exposure differently to the cash, and it's because of the overall portfolio. So 20,000 Rand that you, you open an account, you put 20,000 Rand in, you got 10 times as in the case of Think Markets, you can effectively go and buy 200,000 Rand's worth of shares. And that sounds great, but be careful, particularly as a newbie. You've now basically leveraged yourself to the hilt. You've got a couple of issues. I mean, either you've taken one position and you've, you know, gone absolutely all in on that one position. You've put 20,000 margin in, you've got 200,000 exposure, but that means a slight move against you and you're losing money, and now you're gonna start getting what we call the dreaded margin call or closeouts. Suddenly, if you're gonna get the, like, hey, now you owe money, people want their cash. I also talk around the number of trades that we're having at any one time. Don't do dozens and dozens of trades. Now, there are a couple of reasons for it. Firstly, you should have a strategy, and a good trading strategy truthfully shouldn't be giving you dozens and dozens of trades. If it is, it's too loose. As you move the quality of the strategy, you're going to get less trades. And the other point is, frankly, it's difficult to manage. It's hard to manage a dozen trades. You know, suddenly you've got to, you know, things start going wrong. It's, it's March and, 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 and the pandemic is just starting and markets are collapsing and you're trying to exit and you've got 12 different trades to exit and have you exited them all and where are the prices, which one's first, which one's, etc. When I was trading equity, for me, 
four was about my max. And when I speak to, to equity traders, um, the Goth McKenzie's, the Pitley Radenhases of the world, uh, four, I mean, maybe a, maybe an extra one or two, but four or five is about six perhaps, and they're the, they're the experienced hands. My view is stick to, at any one point, three open trades, and that could be an equity, a currency, and a commodity. And in fact, that idea of having an equity and a currency and a commodity is quite cunning because you're in different asset classes. Now, when the collapse happened in March, everything was correlated to one, everything fell. Gold fell, Bitcoin fell, uh, uh, bonds, commodities, everything fell. But in normal circumstances, and if you look at the market on any one given day, you'll see currencies going one way, you'll see commodities going another way, some equities up, some equities down. So to have a, you know, to say, cool, three trades, one for equities, uh, one for indices maybe, and uh, one for uh, a commodity. So you've got different asset classes that are responding to different movements, different processes within the broader market. Let's look at that example of the 20,000 Rand portfolio. Three positions, uh, ABC, MNO, and XYZ. What they are doesn't actually matter. And as a trader, it truthfully doesn't matter. One of the best traders I know, or met, I didn't know him, I, I met him at a dinner once. Uh, he used to trade Singapore. And I was like, dude, Singapore, like, like Singapore. What do you know about Singapore? And his answer was nothing. And that was the beauty of it. Because as soon as we're trading Zai equity, South African equity, we bring our bias to it, right? We've got a bias to that stock or the other stock. We like the CEO, we don't like the CEO. We suddenly bring that bias to the equation. His answer was quite simple. I don't know what's happening in, in, in Singapore. I, I don't know the politics. I, all I know is the time zone of the, of, the, of the exchange. And to that end, I've quite enjoyed trading the DAX index. I'm sure I know the DAX, it's Germany. But it's a weird index. So, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's a DAX 30, yes, and, and it's just, it's a, it's a bunch of stocks. And when I look at the list of stocks, I don't know who 90% of them are. I mean, 30 shares there, and I probably know two or three of them. And the others, I'm like, I don't know who they are. I don't know what industry. I don't know anything about their CEO or their profit or anything. All I know is price action. And as a trader, price action is what matters. So three stocks. Each of them, you take a, a 20,000 Rand exposure. 10% margin, you've put 2,000 Rand margin down on each. And that's, that's, uh, that's quite small. I mean, it's there. Now, now we're not touching. Some of you are like, what about the 2% rule and the like? We'll come to that. But this is not, the, and that's in next week's. This is not around the, the, the stop losses. We're going to spend a lot of time on that in one of the upcoming sessions. You've taken three positions in three difference, ABC, MNO, and XYZ, 20,000 Rand exposure in each, 10% margin in each of those three positions which means ultimately you got 60,000 Rand exposure and your portfolio, which is of 20,000, is now leveraged three times. And that's, that's manageable. As, as, as a beginner, a three times leverage on your portfolio is giving you wiggle room. We take it a step further. 6,000 margin gives you 14,000 Rand free, crash, free cash sitting in your, in your account. And you're like, okay, but like, what's that free cash there for? Well, let's say... ABC goes down, I don't know, 3%. You haven't been stopped out. You're not in the stop position at all. Then it's gone down 3%. You're not losing money and it's eating into that 14,000. It gives you wiggle room. It also means that let's say all of these trades end up costing you half your margin and you only get 3,000 Rand back. Well, it means that your 20 is now 17,000. You, know, you put in 6,000 margin, you got three back, you're now down to 17,000. If you go all in and you take you know, four positions and you put 5,000 Rand margin into each, you know, and that gives you 200,000 exposure, and suddenly there's a rough day in the market and you end up, you know, your exposure at 3% at, at down, your 20,000 is now going to be around 12, 12,500. And that's a long way back to get to your 20,000. So whilst you've got the cash and you've got the capacity to put a lot more money in and to go much bigger in the process. Don't. Limit yourself. Learn to walk first. Learn to get better at it. Start with just a couple of trades, you know, two, three trades at a time at absolute maximum. Have that said, someone's just messaged me, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's Alexander Older, I think, who talks around the idea of you never want more than 6% uh, of your portfolio at risk and 2% in an individual trade. And I like that idea where you can say, I'm going to limit myself to three trades. 
But if one of them is now where the stop loss is in profit and I get a fourth trade, well, I can maybe bring that one in. I'm now managing four trades, which is a little more complex. And certainly that boggled my head when I would have four. Four, I could, uh, it, it's sorry. But at least what you're going to do is your, 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 your stop loss on the one trade is now in the profit. And we're going to go into all of that in a lot more detail. So it's, it's a great point. Sorry, I, I clicked away before I saw who said it. Uh, it's a great point, but I'm going to come to that in a lot more detail in, in one of the follow-ups. But it's very important that we look at that idea of, of, of how much uh, I I exposure relative to our overall portfolio. Just because we can get 200,000 Rand exposure on 20,000 doesn't mean we should. You know, let's go back to that fancy car we bought. That fancy car might go 250 kilometers an hour. Doesn't mean you should. You know, firstly, speed limit's 120. Secondly, at 250 kilometers an hour, something goes wrong. I mean, you're not in trouble. You're just going to be smeared over the tarmac. So just because it's there doesn't mean we should go and jump into it, boots and all. We need to be more careful, be more circumspect, and truthfully, respectful of the market, particularly while we are learning. Question just popped up, how long does it take to learn? It's going to be different for everyone, but I can tell you it's not going to be measured in weeks or months. It's going to be measured in years. You know, it took me five years. My excuse it was the 90s. There was no, heck, there was barely internet, never mind webcasting, video, and et cetera, et cetera. There was very, there were no courses. There were some books. There were some email-based and user-based, usernet uh, uh, chat groups and the like. Uh, you know, they, we didn't even, I mean, online broking, in about 98, 99, my broker went online. What that meant was they had email. And that was online. You know, now we've got apps and all the rest. I mean, it, it, it fundamentally you know, moved into a different place. But how long to become a proficient trader is going to be measured in years. And understand the point that, you know, it, it's one of those, you know, as we, as, as we become proficient, it's never that we stand back and say, ah, I are a trader. Something we've always got to stay at. It's, it's an elite sports person, right? You know, just because you're the best in the game doesn't mean that you can stop training. You probably you got there because you trained harder than most, and you got to stay there, continue trading harder than most. So as I said, when you're starting, limit the number of open positions to three. And when you're starting, limit the overall portfolio gearing to three. So you got 60,000, sorry, 20,000, you can take 60,000 exposure. You put 100,000 in, you can take 300,000 exposure. You put 5,000 in, you can take 15,000 exposure. And that just, you know, because while you're learning, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to do things that are fundamentally wrong. Things that in time you will look back and you will embarrass yourself. You will be embarrassed. Okay, I did that. Like, you know, it's, it's going to, but uh, you're going to do it. And if you're, if you're restricting your, your amount of exposure, if you're restricting your number of trades, uh, then what ultimately what you're going to do is those mistakes you make are going to cost you less. And then as you start to gain experience, you can increase the number of trades, you know, increase the different asset classes that you, tra that, 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 that you can trade, and you'll find your own limit. For me, it was four. And at four, it was a little edgy. At five, I was stressed. I remember I once had six trades and it was just, it, it was an absolute horror show. It was an absolute horror, horror, horror show. And then in time, truthfully, and, and I'm going to say this, but I want you to please forget it until, until way down the road uh, when, you, when you're starting to get, uh, you know, in time, your overall portfolio gearing becomes less of an issue. I'm saying three, but I'm saying three at the beginning. For example, I trade index futures. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, someone said to me, what's the gearing on the index? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I know what my margin requirement is. I know how many rands I make per point on the index. Um, and I could go and work out what the gearing is. But I honestly don't know what that gearing is. Because, because I'm being disciplined, because I, I, I'm, I'm rigid around my stop loss. So my losses are always going to be capped um, at, 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 at a maximum level, around about 0.8 or 1% of my portfolio. Because of that, to me, it's about rands and cents. You know, I will say to you, well, today I made 900 points in the market or, you know, uh, on, what is today? On, on Monday, I think it was, sorry, Friday, I think I lost 550 points. Um, how much I'm gearing the portfolio becomes less of an issue. It's how much money I can lose not how much money I can make, how much money I can lose in a single trade. That's what starts to matter. And that becomes the 2% rule. And we'll talk about that when we go and focus on, on risk and trading risk in particular. So exposure, your trading risk is based on that exposure. 
your overall risk, because if it goes to zero or if it doubles, that, that's your pain point. Uh, your profit is based on that exposure or your loss. If we go back to this slide here, I referenced your return as a percentage relevant to your exposure, but your profit, your 10% move, two and a half thousand rand, was based on the exposure. It's not based on your, on your margin. Your percentage is a profit, yes, but your return is from, from that exposure there. Your trading fees are based on exposure. So if you go in and you start, you got 20K and you're trading 200,000 exposure, your fees are going to be giant. And if nothing else, that will start to eat significantly into your, your portfolio. And your daily CFD interest is also based. Remember when you're doing a CFD, and I, I, I'm going to touch on this now because it's an important point. I spoke about it last month, but it's important we come back to it. When you went and took that, that, that position and you took 20,000 Rand exposure, the, the provider is hedging. And what I mean by hedging is they go into the market and they buy those shares. They've had to put the cash out. So what do they do? Well, they charge your interest on that 20,000. And that interest is based not on the margin, but on the exposure. So again, if you take a 20,000 Rand portfolio and you gear it up tenfold, so you're now exposed to 200,000, your fees are going to be giant. Your interest on a daily basis is going to be giant. And that's going to quickly eat into your, your 20,000 Rand that you've got in your portfolio, even if you're making profit. If you've got a losing trades, and with respect as a beginner, losing trades are, are, are the more likely part of the process. If you're running losing trades in this scenario, then what's going to happen is now you've got two headwinds. One, you've got your fees and your interest hurting you. And two, you've got your losing trades hurting you at the same time. And then the last point I want to touch on is closeout. Closeout is hugely important. Um, I think Ivorn was a, uh, who was the other one I dismissed. Um, I didn't dismiss you, Philip. Sorry, I dismissed your question. Um, both mentioned it. There comes a point where your broker is basically going to step in. In the olden days, we called it margin call. So in the olden days, if your portfolio started heading towards zero and you had no money left, the broker would phone you up and say, you know, dear sir, dear madam, uh, you're starting to run out of money. Please, can you send some more? You know, if you could get it to us, I don't know, tomorrow, the day after, Friday would be fine. Um, please, and you would like, sure, sure. And you would, I suppose you would probably have to go and deposit a check in the very, very old days. And you would top it up. But these days, these processes are automated. Client bases are too big. Basically, brokers are pretty much across the board. They're doing all the auto closeouts. Some of them may send you email and SMS alerts, but you're going to be close out. What is a close out? When you're running out of cash in your portfolio, so you know, you, you, let's go back to this scenario here. Let's use this one here. So you had 20,000. You've put 6,000 in as a margin. You're now left with 14,000 Rand in cash. Okay, but then something happens and the market is in free fall. These were all long positions. The market is in free fall and you, the market is falling and you, you're basically, you, you, you're getting eaten up. You're getting taken to the cleaners um, and you're about to hit zero. And at that point, you're going to start eating into the broker's money and they're not here. They don't want to be a lender of money. So what their broker will do is they will start exiting your positions. This does two things. It stops the bleeding also adds cash back into your account because remember there was margin. So in those three positions, they close one of them, that frees up 2,000 Rand, boom, you've now got 2,000 Rand extra in your port portfolio, which gives your other two positions a little more wiggle room. Now truthfully, that shouldn't be happening to a trader. It happens to you for one of two reasons, lack of discipline slash strategy, all markets have crashed or gone in crazily high. You know, they've gone against you by extremes. But truthfully, those crashes or extreme moves are less frequent, and particularly if you've got a couple of positions open. One of the stocks, maybe you know, multi-choice 7% or something. Um, of course, if you're trading the Sohol Suns and, and the like, then anything is possible. And I know the problem with the Sohol Suns and the like, and let me quickly go down that road, is you're always like, yeah, but Simon, that thing went up you know, hundreds of percent in a week. And if I geared that, I would have made, you know, thousands of percent. Yes. But sometimes you will be on the wrong side. There was a great tweet I saw on Twitter, and I, I don't know who the person was. It's not someone I follow. Someone had retweeted it. And their comment was that they're still shell-shocked by when oil went negative. And he says, you know what? I had no open position. I, I don't trade oil. 
there was no threat of me. He said, but what absolutely shook him to his core is that there's always a bad beat lying out there. And the problem with a bad beat, the problem with being short of Soho and not being able to get out because of that squeeze or, you know, and that's extreme here. The problem with those bad beats is they devastate, they decimate portfolios. And when I say decimate, they can take you to zero and more. They can take you to those minus numbers. I spoke up right up front. But they also, they damage your brain. They, they hurt your head and it's hard to come back from that. So the broker will exit. As soon as you start getting into dangerous territory, the broker will exit. Your risk is going to be overnight. And particularly when we, you know, back in, in, in March when markets were proper melting down back in 2008, 2009, sometimes we get giant gaps in, 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 in individual stocks. You know, i give you an example. Market closes, everything seems okay. Uh, and after the close, the company that you've got a position in issues an update and says, well, let's take Steinhoff. Says it turns out our boss wasn't quite legit and we're not sure about our results and we can't publish them. And the stock, the first trade is 50% down. And that's ungeared. And, and at some point, you know, at some point you're going to be on the wrong side of that sort of trade. Now, if that happens and you're, get, and you're exposed to the hilt, that's going to decimate. I mean, 50% down, 10 times geared, 500%. That's why you want to manage those individual positions. And, that's, you know, and to how many you're having, to managing the overall exposure of your portfolio. And when we come back next month, we'll talk in particular around managing the process of, of, of risk of 2% rules and the like. But you, know, you also stop this with your trading strategy. When will you exit if you're wrong? What is your stop loss? Get out before the closeout. I think markets will let you put a stop loss in. And I guess at that point, they'll get you out. Of course, if there's a gap and there's an air pocket, well, unfortunately, they can't get you out at the point you wanted. They'll get you out at the point that they can. And we manage this, <clears throat> excuse me, especially again, I say it when we're starting, we manage it by three times max uh, 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 leverage in a portfolio overall. I know there's more out there, but we need to learn what we're doing. And I go back to the motor car scenario. You know, the first time we got into a car and, and, and was learning how to drive, and first time we sat behind the wheel and there's a gear stick and a clutch and accelerator and a brake and we decide we don't need the brake and indicators are for, for other people. Um, and all of that's great and fine and everything else. But we got into a car. We didn't get into a Formula One car. In a Formula One car, you look at that accelerator, man, you're halfway down the track and you still don't even know how to turn the wheel yet. It's the same with trading. In time, you'll be, dry, you'll be trading like a Formula One driver, but to start with, you need to start like, you know, pretend it's a go-kart. Now, I don't mean those, those powered go-karts, I mean those pedal go-karts. Remember those ones we had as kids? Well, I didn't have one, but some of the kids next door had one. So start slow, because if you start slow, you're going to get less bruising, you're going to lose less money, you're more likely to stay in the game, you're more likely to become an efficient, professional, and ultimately profitable trader. So in closing, and then you'll take a couple more questions, start simple, know the basics. Yeah, and I said it right up front in this presentation, you know, this is, this is stuff which an experienced trader looks at and says it's elementary. Of course it is because they're an experienced trader, but to a newbie, we need to learn that stuff. The first one in the series, we just talked around what's an index, what's the CFD, what's the future, what's an FX. Now I said already, go and open a demo account. Start to learn, the, you know, you're saying I haven't got any money. That's fine. Learn the process. Learn how the platform works. Learn how to place a trade. Learn the different nuances of the trades and where the buy buttons are and the sell buttons and how to set take profit and stop losses and all of those sort of things. Start to learn that part of the process so that when you've got real cash, your challenge is not where do I click? Your challenge is, well, how much should I be buying? Know your product, know your exposure, test the waters with small trades. You know, think markets, no minimum on local CFD trade. You can go buy one share. And, I mean, you, the, the, take a tiny position. Grow that size as you master the art of that trading. Don't be in a rush. I, I, I know, we're in a hurry. We want to be rich. We want to be this. We want to be everything else. But trading, and I've said it before, trading is like any other skill we decide to learn. And the point being is that we've got to learn it. And learning takes time. Learning takes experience. We can't expect to be the expert on day one. We have to accept that this is going to be a process. It's going to be a process that's going to be measured in years. We also have to recognize that when we get to the other side and we've learned the skill and we're finally efficient and we can call ourselves a trader, 
and be careful of that part because often when we think we're smart, that's when the club comes. But when we start to get to that point, trading becomes easy. As I spoke about last month, when you become an a, 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 a unconscious uh, a trader, it, 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 trading was almost a boring process. But then we've got an amazing skill that we can do from anywhere in the world as long as we've got an internet connection and access to a computer. It, it, it ultimately becomes that simple, but we've got to allow ourselves that space. And we allow ourselves that space by taking it slow at the beginning. Because if we don't take it slow at the beginning, it is absolutely going to hurt. Folks, that's me. Uh, more courses coming up. Um, the one July course is going to be the world after COVID. The first one we did the economic data so far. Uh, and then last week we looked at, um, was it last week? Yes, it was. I, I presented at a trader's matrix um, and ran through that. And then 1st of July, I'm going to be looking at the world after COVID. If you want the other videos, just one lap.com slash think markets. They are all available there, and you can go and book for the various other events that are coming up. You either go to the Think Markets, or you can go to our website. You will find it there. Questions coming through. Lewis, can I start a business as a trader? I love that analogy. Yes, you can. Um, and the short answer is that trading is a business, right? So you need some capital to start, much the same as trading. You need some tools. In this case, it's a computer, it's an internet connection, it's a stockbroker. Um, you need to learn some skills. In this case, it's trading. And like any other business, you're going to have money coming in and money going out. The money coming in will be from profitable trades and extra deposits you make into your portfolio. And the money going out is going to be your, your, your losing trades, your costs, your data feeds, you know, all those, you know, the, the transaction fees, maybe a subscription to Business Day TV or FinWeek or, or you know, whatever the case may be. So I, I, I really like the idea of, of, of really taking the view that trading is a business. And, and you can stick it in a PTY if you want. Truthfully, the, the tax benefits are moot. SARS has closed all the tax loopholes that ever existed. Um, but as a, as, a, as a mindset to it, yes, trading is a business. And as something which you can then treat as a business. And by that, what I mean is, could this be your eight hour a day, 40, day, 40 hours a week job? It could. Of course, it could be a lazy business. You could do it for just a couple of hours a day. And of course, you can do it from anywhere where you have a computer and a screen. So I love that question. It is absolutely. Brandon, should your exposure be lower than the total value in account or is it in, in, inevitable, inevitable for this to be higher? I wouldn't. So what you're suggesting, if I'm understanding you correctly, Brandon, is you're saying you've got 20,000 Rand, make your exposure 20,000 Rand. I mean, it's basically almost one for one at the exposure level, but not necessarily because you'd still, you know, if you've got 20,000 Rand and you open one trade um, and you, you take a 20,000 Rand position in that trade, your margin's two grand and you've got 20,000 Rand exposure and 20,000 Rand cash. Um, I, I like the idea and I think your logic is perfectly sound. What you're saying is, let's go really, really careful up front. Almost, you know, one-to-one, -one. I mean, a, a, a one-times geared portfolio. And even if you're aiming at a, at a three times geared portfolio, there will be times when your portfolio is geared zero because you've got no trades or geared one because you've only got a single trade. But your logic is perfectly sound. You know, why not say, when I start, let's cap this at 20 grand. I've got 20 grand cash. Let me cap my exposure at 20 grand. And then, and then what's very important is set measurables that you will say, when I meet these, these targets, I can then move it to 40 and then 60,000 exposure and 80 and 100, what would those targets be? Don't, you know, those targets would be, have I done five perfect trades in a row? Don't make them profitable trades because profitable trades might happen in spite of you. This, and, and I spoke around perfect trades in, in, in last month. And as I said, the videos are available there. Do a perfect trade. And a perfect trade is these are the five, six, seven conditions that you think are required for a good trade. And you can do everything right and still lose money. I lost, I, had a, uh, 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 I was talking about, you know, 500 point loss. Uh, I think it was Friday or Monday, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and it's not stressing me. Why? Because I did everything right. And sometimes I'll do everything right and I'll lose money. Most times I'll do everything right and make money. So, Brendan, I like that. It was Brendan. And then what you do is then and set the measurables and say, five perfect trades, I can increase it to 30. And then another five, and I can go to 40. But give yourself those targets, which you then ratchet it up and make those targets absolutely measurable. 
Uh, Jacques, if you begin it with 20,000, be sufficient to start with small trades, exposure and learning? Usually the answer is no, but in the case of think markets on the SA uh, CFDs, equity CFDs, there's no minimum, so you can take the small trades. Um, and what happens is a lot of brokers will charge a minimum brokerage fee. And that then completely knocks your numbers over. As a rule, I would say you need more. As a rule, I would say, you know, if you're trading in an ideal world to trade equities, probably 100,000. Um, but because of the lack of the minimum, and I'm going to come into that in a lot more when we do the 2% rule uh, in, in a couple of weeks, in that sense, suddenly you can come in with those smaller amounts. I mean, Red One, who, who, Red One Mueller, who, who, who's running uh, Think Market since in, in locally, um, you know, his favorite is like, just buy one share. They're like literally, you know, like he keeps on fiddling around, you know, it's small trade here, small trade there. And you can do it because of that lack of minimum. Uh, Ivor saw yours there. There are a couple, are there some? Yep, there's some coming in the chat. Let me have a quick chat. Um, side note, due to high interest in CFD shares and SA will be compliant. This webinar with a CFD, oh, let me try that again. Okay, note from Red One, who is the boss. Due to the high interest on CFD shares in SA Think Markets, we'll complement this webinar with a CFD share one on 30th of June. Clients attending this webinar will be invited to it also. Cool, cool. Okay, so Think Markets doing another one. They will send you an email directly. That coming from Redwan Muller, uh, and he will send you an email directly for that event, which will be on the 30th. I'm trying to run my head, so I don't know. Is that a Wednesday? It's towards the end of June. It's sometimes towards the end of the month. He will send you details around that. It's a Tuesday. There we go. I love that. When people can talk back to me straight away, absolutely no problem. i got a couple of minutes left. Uh, i got a question, but one more. If you've got some more questions, you're welcome to, answer, to, to send a few more in. Um, of course, contact details, importantly, contact details for Think Markets, and of course, always legal disclaimers. Um, question is, uh, what should, okay, wh 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 where's the perfect place to start trading in terms of underlying assets? So I covered that in the, in the previous webcast. I, I like indices, um, and I like indices because you know, when last did an index do 7% in a day? Well, the truthful honest is April. But if I'd asked you that question in February, the answer would have been 2008. Um, so they're less volatile. And again, I know what the trader wants is they like that volatility. And why did I pick 7%? Because that is what uh, uh, you know, MultiChoice did today. MultiChoice is a, is a is a mid cap. But certainly in the last couple of weeks, we've seen some of our banks, top 40 banks, top 40 property stocks doing double digits in a day. And that's lovely if you're on the right side of the trade. But at some point in your trading career, you're going to be on the wrong side of the trade. So I like indices because they're less volatile. Currencies are the least volatile and therefore the best. The problem with currencies, however, um, is that you're trading against the proper pros. You know, JP Morgan, City Chase Manhattan, et cetera, et cetera. They get their best five traders. They give them $100 million and they say, go trade FX. And that's starting with the shocks. Not a good idea. Uh, when you buy one share, will it be profitable taking into consideration the fees involved? Yeah, because there's no minimum fee. It is. So if there's no minimum fee and the fee is just a percentage, 0.2, then you're literally, you literally, you buy a 10 rand share, uh, 10, you know, it's, it's your, your, your fee is going to be literally cents. So it actually is. And you know, the great thing with that, because a lot of the platforms, I mean, I see minimums out there. I mean, there's some platforms out there with minimums of hundreds of rands. You've got a 200 rand minimum. You've got to effectively do a, a I'm trying to run the math. You've got to do 100,000. And even then, you're actually paying quite a chunky process. So the lack of minimum. And what it means is that you can test the waters. You can try the system. You can test your emotional response to it. Well, does think markets offer any Islamic uh, compliant non-interest leverage options? Uh, I'm not sure. Red One, have you guys got Islamic uh, compliant? Um, I'm going to see. Uh, Red One says, yes, we do. Uh, contact them on the, on the customer support. They absolutely do. Nice. They can go and solve that problem. That's actually great to know. I actually get that question a heck of a lot. And usually the answer is from the platform is they truthfully not sure what you're asking. And the answer is typically no. Um, Bruno, if I trade indices, do I trade NASDAQ? I don't trade NASDAQ. I used to trade S&P. S&P minis is my favorite thing in the world to trade. Problem? Time zone.
you know, I can't drink and trade. I have to drink or trade. I can't drink in the day. So then I had to either trade or drink. Um, yeah, and I chose the red wine. Yes, yes. So, so I mean, so I don't. I mean, to me, the, the, the S&P minis was absolutely brilliant. The, the point being, Bruno, is that, you know, for me, the NASDAQ is, has been a, a roaring index right now, and it's been huge money on the upside. But as an index trader, I don't care if it's going sideways. I mean, our top 40 went sideways for five years. I made, I made money trading it because I was trading in such a short time frame that the sidewaysness didn't matter to me because there was moves plenty for it for me. Um, and, and the E-mini, the S&P, I loved it because of its insane liquidity. But the time zone killed me. And, and, and the point I was coming to, which is, we need to not force ourselves into the market and to adapt to the market. We need to adapt the market to us, which is why the DAX, why the DAX? Same time zone, because it's Germany. So we're in exactly the you know, same time zone. So no problem. It's the same trading hours that I'm normally trading. And it's an index I know nothing about. My problem with NASDAQ is I know too much about it. Therefore, it brings bias and time zones. Don't like it. Uh, I've seen you uh, COVID-19 ETS or bundles as a newbie take advantage of those. It's going truthfully with any bundle or ETF or something is interrogate the methodology and what is in it. I've seen some bundles and I'll give you an example. Now I'm not going to give an example because the person who I would refer to as litigious, let's not get sued. Um, where on the sticker, it will say something. And when you go and actually look inside, it's not, let's use the NASDAQ, for example. So everyone thinks the NASDAQ is a tech heavy index. It is a tech heavy index, but you know that it's tech weighting is actually 40 odd percent. In other words, it's actually less than half. As opposed to uh, uh, some you know, dedicated tech, and I'm thinking there's a, a, a local JSC ETF, which is 100% tech. So NASDAQ is less than half of those shares in the NASDAQ are actually tech stocks. So the, the point is, go dig into it. Go have a look and see what it actually, actually is offering. Yolandi, uh, thanks for that insight. Need to log off. Uh, absolute pleasure, Yolandi. Thank you very much. Good night. Um, Anthony, do you buy for a specific time period or is it open-ended? Oh, that's a great question. And it's beyond the remit of this evening's presentation, but I love the question, so let's go into it. And my answer could be days, so I'm just quickly thinking of how to answer this without keeping us all here until tomorrow. So in my trading, I'm a trend-based trader. So as a rule, and I, and I want to asterisk that as a rule because I've got an exception. As a rule, when I get into a position, it's trend-based, and I'm very much a case of this trend could last who knows how long? And, and they're crazy trends. Let's take the example of the NASDAQ. I mean, the NASDAQ has been insane. It's, it's above 10,000. It's at all-time highs. It's ridiculous. Um, and if you're taking a long position in NASDAQ sometime in April or May, um, and you'd made yourself your 10 or 20%, you probably would have thought, yo, and taken the money, except it carried on going and going and going and going. So as a trend-based trader, when I get in, I put a trailing stop, and ultimately, I exit on that stop. I let the stop take me out. And the reason is because those trends can go on, and the NASDAQ is an example. And the NASDAQ, let's be clear, is still going. It might be red this evening, but certainly it hasn't indicated any indication of reversal patterns yet. The NASDAQ is still going. So you still want to be in that trade. Now, the exception is if I'm doing chart patterns, particularly head and shoulders, you've got a target, you aim for that target, you hit it, you take your money and run. I just think markets offer, uh, sorry, that question came on that side. Uh, and there we've seen that there, the questions are all done. Our time is hit, ladies and gents, we will park it there. Uh, my thanks to Red One and his team for uh, uh, giving us the opportunity this evening. Remember all the other events coming up. So what we do is this is the second Wednesday. So we're doing the Know Your Derivatives. We've got another session on 8 July. Uh, next week, we're going to be trading 101. We'll do a trading plan. We'll start from A, we'll go all the way to Z, um, and then there's the how to use the website, and then we roll into July, where we will look the first week of July, the world after COVID-19. Uh, trying to, how do we want it to look? How would it look? How can we influence it? What are the pros and cons? And all of the rest. You can find those links all there. Ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time this evening. Christo, absolute pleasure. Uh, again, contact details for Think Markets if you've got questions or follow ups. Ladies and gents, everyone have a great evening further. Uh, stay safe. I was going to say travel safe, but you're not traveling anywhere. You're at your home. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Wear a mask when you head out. Cheers, all. Have a good evening.